in, in reflecting of all your your comments, uh, I just want to add the North American Waterfall Management Plan is is under revision right now. It was created in what year? 1986, and uh, they're doing a revision and, and adding some more things, some some ideas about engaging the public to do more more wetland uh, restoration. And, and I'm quite proud of the fact that uh, one of our own, Dr. Gray Anderson, was asked to serve on that revision board for the North American Waterfall Management Plan. So Tennessee absolutely does. Uh, provide quite a bit of the leadership for, for waterfowl in this continent. Uh, the last thing that I have on the agenda for the Wildlife Committee is we bring before the, the committee a proclamation, Proclamation 14-14. And what this proclamation is, is an amendment to the Proclamation 05-10, which is the Controlled and Commercial Shooting Preserve Proclamation. And we just have one minor amendment we'd like to do. Uh, under Section 1, that governs uh, the take seasons on these controlled and commercial shooting preserves. As it stands right now, the waterfowl take season is from March 15th to October 15th. And we are recommending a change uh, to November 15th. And what this will do is it'll make sure it coincides with the closure of our refuges on public lands. And that's all we have for this proclamation. Any questions from the committee, the commission? Do I hear a motion? Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? On the Wildlife Committee, all in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Daryl, is that all you have? Yes. Mr. Chairman, that's all for the Wildlife Committee. All right. Thank you, Vice Chairman Cox. and. Uh, Chairman Woodson, we're glad to have you and let the record show that she is present. At this time, I will go to Retention Recruitment Committee Chairman James Stroud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, the Chair would like to recognize, recognize Mark Thurman, uh, Fish in the Classroom Report. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today to give you an update on an outreach project that the agency's involved in. This is a program that started in Region 3 and is, has grown over the last couple of years. It's called Fish in the Classroom, and we were approached uh, back in 2012 by the friends of Del Hollow National Hatchery. Uh, the friends group was very active in the, in the area with uh, local schools. Uh, primarily with um, trout in the classroom type projects. And they approached uh, the agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Cookville Field Office, Tennessee Aquarium, uh, and Tennessee Tech University to work on this uh, outreach program. They wanted to model it after the trout in the classroom uh, program. If you're not familiar with that, um, classes receive a batch of trout eggs and then grow those eggs out. They feed the fish, they monitor the growth. Uh, it's a learning process for them in, in, in many different ways. And then the end result is that the fish are stocked in, in some local waters. So it takes them through that process. Well, this one was a little different. What they really wanted to do was to uh, do something that increased awareness of, of, of life in local waters. Uh, so what they wanted to do was work with native fish. And so we put a group together to, to figure out how we could do this. And um, we did this, uh, this started like the fall of 2012. By uh, 2013, we did our first field day in, in uh, January of uh, 2013. And uh, this was in Jackson County. Um, this was also part of the program that's a little different in that it had this field component where we bring uh, students out to uh, to a stream and and kind of show them how we do our work. You'll see some guys with backpack shockers and sains there, um, and uh, it was a it was a success. So we got through the first year. The fish did well in the classes, and um, the next fall, uh, when we went to do the program again, we had added some schools, but we uh, we had Tennessee's Wildside came out to uh, do a shoot, and. Uh, 
What I'd like to do is, I don't think I can capture the, the spirit of this program as well as this video does. And I want to show this to you, and then I've got a couple more slides. But this was also, while I'm setting this up, shot at the Boyles Wildlife Management Area in Jackson County. Uh, it's a fairly new wildlife management area, uh, and as you see the scenery there, uh, you'll see that it's a, it's a pretty nice place. It provides river access to two state scenic rivers, uh, and it's right at 120 acres, so it provides good hunting opportunity in the area as well. Hello everybody, I'm Janet Ivey. I'm Bill Cody. Welcome in. When it comes to freshwater fish, the southeastern United States is a treasure chest of biodiversity. Nearly 500 different fish species make their home here. That's over 60% of all the fish in the country. Sounds like a lot of fish to keep track of <laughs> or learn about. But some students in the Upper Cumberland region of Tennessee are finding it's a little bit easier to learn about all those fish. That's because the fish are coming to their classroom. Wild Side Guide Ken Tucker takes us to the Roaring River in Jackson County, where high school students are learning by getting their hands wet. It's an unusual way to start a class. Today we're going to use a backpack shocker and we're going to use the same. But this is not your usual classroom. I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's school without windows or walls. There's something where hope is. I'll get another one. Okay, find another one there. Education enhanced by environment. You try to pinch me. <laughs> I touched the fish for the first time. Today? Uh huh. It's the first time. It's hard to get them to sit still in a classroom. Are they just like bottom feeders? You bring them out here and they would be happy to stay till 5 o'clock this afternoon. Today, student biologists work side by side with professional biologists, conducting a scientific survey of the Roaring River to see what lives here. But that's the, that little one, that's what we ended up getting last year. You'll see some fish that you recognize, some of your bass and your red eye and things like that, but you're all gonna see some fish that you didn't maybe know were in there, some different kinds of minnows and things called darters that live on the bottom. The biologists work their way downstream armed with probes that send small amounts of electricity into the water, temporarily stunning the fish and making them easier to net. There's darters. Yep, there's darters. Darters. Uh, sunfish. Where's the sunfish? Ah, is it the sunfish? Getting to deal with professionals, all the guys that you see here today, and talk the same lingo that they are is an important part of science education. The students also gather sediment from along the stream bed, sorting through and looking for benthic organisms, animals living in the river that are often good food for fish, like this Helgramite. Everybody loves them for fish bait. He breathes, but he's got uh, gills under each leg. If you look at it under a microscope, or anything, you can see that his gills are under his legs on each appendage. It's always neat to see their faces light up when they start seeing the different kinds of fish that are there, the different uh, kinds of aquatic organisms that are there, the crayfish and the aquatic insects. We caught some really, really little catfish, which I've never seen a little catfish in my whole entire life. I didn't even know they existed in these waters, and I live around here, I always have. Today's water work reinforces concepts covered in class. It's a hands-on nitrogen cycle lesson. And then the other thing is just ID, being able to use scientific documentation. What's this thing? That's a darter. That's a red line darter. And this little guy, you see these two little white blotches here? It's almost like shaped like an hourglass. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a characteristic of the red lines. Cool. It's a fun way of learning that really connects with students. <laughs> Well, you guys get the award for most crayfish. There's no doubt about that. See if they're all the same kind. I think it's pretty awesome. We got to experience being in the water and seeing all the different kinds of fish and actually experiencing the catching of the fish. Some things you can't learn by looking at a book. Some things you have to pick it up with your hand. It doesn't take them long once they see the crayfish or they see water pennies to start going, well, what do these do and where do they fit in? and and. How many different kinds of these are there in the river? These fish, to me, look like a dinosaur fish. He is very happy to be in here with all his little friends that he uh, can fit into his mouth. But uh, to me, he looks prehistoric. Two years after a project like this, they'll still know what a green-sided darter is. 
where if I put that on a board and had them do a report on it, that's gone in a week. To be able to get their hands in the water and to be able to hold it in their hand instead of looking at a picture in the book is invaluable. See how those fins are? Like, hold your hand down in the water, you can kind of get a sense for the way the, the fins do. In a perfect world, every student at this school would have made it down to the river this morning, but that really wasn't possible. So those that did make it down brought a little of the river back to the school. Thanks to a special permit, this warm water aquarium will become home for the rest of the school year to several of the fish the students found in the river. Species like northern studfish, red line darters, green side darters, striped shiners, scarlet shiners, and long-eared sunfish. It's a classroom aquarium project started by the Friends of Dale Hollow Fish Hatchery. It gives everyone at the school a chance to learn more about what lives in the river, from the warm water native species to a cold water system where trout grow big from tiny eggs. The tanks are a unique opportunity to study fish up close and learn about the delicate balance between life and environment. You get to watch the fish grow, how they eat. You watch their data. You watch the ammonia levels, the nitrogen levels, the oxygen levels. And if they get out of what it's supposed to be, the fish die. What do we do with the crawdads? But there's more to be learned than just biology. Last year we had the art teacher did they did art drawings and they did sculptures of, of trout. The English department uses it to write stories and news releases of what's going on in the tank. And our math teacher used it as a math program to figure out how much food you have to feed and what length of time to get what size fish. Just because we go back in six months and there aren't as many fish doesn't mean that something's gone wrong with the boils. There are seasonal changes. The number of crawdads that you were able to catch, that was remarkable. See, they're an indicator species. And that lets us know if there are crayfish in the water, it's pretty clean water. If something starts happening and we start not seeing those, then it doesn't mean necessarily that something's wrong, but it's time to ask some more questions. Questions that can now be asked by young people who have a closer connection with the river and what lives there. <laughs> One of the little gals today said, well, I was just out here swimming last night. I didn't realize all this stuff was in here. You know, that's the kind of aha moments that we like kids to have. I find it just truly exciting to see the kids get excited about these fish, and they do. Hopefully, the way that people treat it will start to change as you start influencing some of the younger people in the area. They have a better appreciation for the place. They start taking ownership of it. That change has begun. The students are already doing river cleanups and are working to find ways to make others more aware of what they have learned. It's a scenic river. If we overfish it and pollute it, future generations won't be able to come here and enjoy it. It makes me want to keep the habitat safe, maybe talk to people about it. Pretty awesome. I mean, they're beautiful fish. I'm Ken Tucker on the wild side. Our website at wildsidetv.com. So, as you can see, the, the students got a lot out of it. You see a lot of, um, you know, some of the same students. We just did our collection uh, at this same site for Jackson County uh, this past Monday. Some of the same students were out there, um, talked with them a good bit. They, they go there, they fish, they, uh, they use the place, and, and uh, I think we're, we're uh, really uh, increasing awareness of, of what, what's in our rivers and streams in the state, or in this part of the state anyway. So right now we're at uh, 10 tanks. We started out with a couple of these warm water tanks or cool water tanks. And uh, now we're up to 10 tanks uh, in those counties, Clay, Hamilton, Jackson, Macon, Putnam, and Warren. Um, you know, I talked about partnerships, but it also kind of put us in a, within the agency, different groups working together to make this happen. Fisheries Division, Environmental Services has been involved, and our Law Enforcement uh, Division has been involved, both at uh, the state level and, and, and in our local districts. So uh, it's been a really good program, and, and uh, it's something uh, we feel like is a good investment of, of our time. So with that, I'll take any questions on this program. Good. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Chair recognizes, <clears throat> excuse me, Don King. He's going to give us a report on the uh, promotional campaign and outreach efforts. Mr. Chairman, as Don's coming to the mic, may I just make a quick comment on Please. the last presentation? Yes. I've spent the last five hours with the governor and several folks from around the state in business, philanthropy, education, and the entire conversation was focused around how do we prepare students for success in their future so they can be uh, they can have economic freedom they can have individual freedom they can be good stewards of the land and of their communities and the kinds of programs that we just saw where you have project-based learning you have integrated curriculum where you've got science making more sense because they're talking about it in math class and math class making more sense because they're talking about it in the arts. That's actually what all of this other stuff in education is really all about when it gets boiled down to what does it mean for kids. And so that the agency is taking such an active role to align with these big, hairy, audacious goals to advance student learning is very exciting to me. And I think that's very good for kids. I think it's good for the state. I think it's good for our economic future. And I think it's really good for those of us who are dedicated to preserving and growing opportunities in the outdoors. So I just, I'm a little bit high off of an opportunity to focus the conversation more on kids and what they need. And that's a great example of what kids need. Yeah, so thanks. Totally agree. Thank you so much, Chris. James, I got something I just thought of if you yes, don't mind. Um, Mark, if, and you may do this, I didn't see it obviously, but when you're talking to the children about your biology and, and, and all the things you talk about, I would ask you to, to interject something about the cost involved and TWRA pays for this and how TWRA gets its money and encourage them to start thinking about how the agency's funded and that kind of thing when they, in, in the conservation of rivers and streams and all the education, you might mention that how it's paid for. Okay, I, I think we I think we cover it, and but I'll make sure in the future that we emphasize that that's how we operate and and, and how their state agency, their wildlife agency, um, operates and and where our funding comes from. So always try to take that opportunity. It's a very good suggestion. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bill. Mr. Don. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, a hard act to follow, Mark great job on the, on the program and all and uh, but in the uh, along the same vein of getting the word out and uh, getting people motivated to uh, get outdoors and, and participate and uh, you know ultimately buy more licenses so that we can do the work we need to do uh, I, I wanted to present to you uh, a couple of a few items here that might be a little bit under the radar sometimes and, and I'm going to start with a an effort we've done uh, with email marketing. We've we've toyed with this over uh, the last couple of years to some degree. Uh, we really started back in the spring uh, with a with a more concerted effort. Um, uh, we we really had a challenge in acquiring the email addresses. For a long time, we we kind of had uh, oh. Uh, a given number of, of addresses, somewhere in the 15, 20,000 maybe, uh, of folks that would give us their email address. There was really no incentive for them to do that. There was no, uh, uh, at the point of sale, it was always a challenge to try to get emails because if you can imagine going up to Walmart and buying your license and somebody, if they ask you the question, if you'd like to give the agency your email so that we could contact you, uh, whether they could get all that down on that little point of purchase machine correctly uh, was also a challenge. So uh, with the advent of our mobile site and the uh, mobile app, uh, it's really, really helped us in that vein. Uh, we've really been able to capture a lot more email addresses. Uh, People are, are willing to give us that email address so we can confirm with them their sale and their their uh, registrations and, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, our email database has grown to over 200,000 now. This latest uh, mailing we did was about 205,000. 
a 66 percent increase uh, over over what we had about a year before that. Uh, it's been a very good cooperative effort uh, between our IT division and uh, of course INE and and our uh, our provider Active Outdoors that that does our license sales for us. Uh, they've they've done uh, helped us put this together uh, at no charge for this this service. And this is what the uh, latest email uh, looks like that went out August 22nd, just run on the run up to opening a dove season. And um, if you can see there the top part of the image, I just kind of zoomed in a little bit for you there. But we put a, a call to action there um, uh, at the at the very top. We're we're uh, letting people know dove season starts September 1 at noon. And, uh, you know, kind of tugging at the heartstrings just a little bit with more time for what matters most. And an image there of uh, uh, family members or, or folks that enjoy the outdoors together. And then uh, we were able to put three messages down there. One reminding about the uh, mobile app to download that if they haven't already. Um, and with a live link that takes them right to the place where they can download that app. Uh, Dove season opens, a little write up about that. Uh, the live link on that message takes them to a place where they can check out where the dove fields are on our website. Uh, moment of freedom uh, for wheelchair bound. We wanted to begin getting that word out and connecting people with the, the resources and the and the ability to go to the website that will direct them to the places they need to go to take advantage of the, uh, the new sites that we're providing. Uh, the email metrics come back from Active Outdoors and as you can see we delivered uh, about 205,000, uh, over 205,000. The open rate was about 15%. And I was talking to Michael May earlier, our IT chief. Uh, we discussed this yesterday, and he uh, he said that the, you know, according to industry standards and all, that this is a very very high rate of uh, of open this this fifteen percent. Keeping in mind that represents over thirty thousand people uh, that that read our message, and the click through rate uh, two point three eight percent, taking us through. Uh, to the various sites that that uh, were linked to those messages uh, within the body of the the email and uh, very detailed information as you can see I won't go into all of that but basically we do a follow-up email about two weeks after the initial one goes out uh, to the ones that did not open the very first go around so we kind of follow up give them a second chance to to uh, take advantage of the message that we sent to them. We hadn't gotten the, uh, the details back on that particular follow-up yet, but uh, next messages are coming up very soon, late September, highlighting opening days and Tennessee Wildlife Magazine subscriptions and Moment of Freedom and, and various other topics that we want to, uh, we want to promote out there. Um, and uh, I was also talking with uh, Michael that we are developing a voluntary email submission um, way that we can send people to the site and we ask them for their, their email address to submit so that we can uh, include them in these mailings. Many of them, uh, as I said, you know, they downloaded the app or they've, they've made a purchase or uh, checked in big game online and so we, we acquired their email that way. If they haven't done it that way, we'll give them another opportunity to uh, connect with us. One other thing, uh, or uh, the second thing I wanted to share with you was uh, some promotions we've done with uh, local sporting events here in the Middle Tennessee area, but it, it's, it has statewide uh, reach. We've, we've uh, done an agreement with Tennessee Titans Radio, and uh, we've We've placed a, uh, a spot in each of the first 10 games. That starts with the preseason games and goes through the first six regular season games. And uh, we get a spot in the 
the game, the, the play-by-play game, and we also get a spot during the coaches show. And I've uh, listened several times that we've gotten double the amount. So uh, occasionally they'll, they'll throw in an extra one for us. Uh, we've been able to run spots. Hi, I'm like Charlie this. Daniels, and I'm here for your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. You know, I think the greatest thing my daddy ever did for me was to take me hunting and fishing. Stuff that I never will forget as long as I live. We live in Tennessee. It don't get no better than that. We got some of the best hunting and fishing and some of the most beautiful country in the world. So why don't you make some memories that'll last you a lifetime? Take somebody hunting or fishing, somebody you love, make you feel real good. And thanks again to Commissioner Stroud for helping line that that session up where we were able to get Charlie to do that for us. And we've done uh, other stuff like this. Tennessee hunters and anglers are the real heroes when it comes to wildlife and fish conservation in our state. Your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency supports itself and its programs with these licensed dollars. They can even be purchased online at tnwildlife.org. As a Titans fan, you can show your support for all wildlife by purchasing a license this year. And this is the coverage uh, that we get on the Titans radio network and all the stations are listed there. I know it's hard to read on there, but uh, uh, just looking at the map as an overview, it's, it's very wide and touches other states as well. I think I covered that, that basically what we get. And uh, stepping away from football to baseball, uh, we, we were able to work with the uh, Nashville Sounds the last three seasons, this is the, the end of the third season that we've worked with them uh, on, a, on a promotion. Uh, it's ended up being called Swing for the Trees. Initially it was called uh, Break a Bat, Plant a Tree, but basically we, uh, we came up with a, a little better catchphrase for that. Uh, Swing for the Trees, uh, Dave McKinney uh, threw a contact that, that he initiated and uh, Pandy English working on the program with us has uh, helped put this together. And basically when, uh, when the sounds break a bat at a home game, money is set aside that, uh, we're, that uh, equates to planting trees. And we've, we've done several tree planting sessions already uh, based on that. We uh, also get a couple of uh, information table nights at the, at the games. We did that uh, a couple of nights on high attendance night, happened to be scout nights. And uh, so the, the stadium was full and as the people are coming in to uh, attend the game, uh, we provide an information table. And uh, last time we did it, we had uh, Jen Frosher. She's a, a raptor educator that uh, brought her red tail hawk and as you can see, she drew a good crowd for us as we were uh, standing around uh, dispersing information about the agency. And uh, last year's presentation there, uh, they, they awarded uh, a bat at home plate uh, for the program and announced over the PA system and all. And this year's presentation as well. And then Here's the culmination, uh, trees get planted. This was Donaldson uh, Middle School, and uh, we went out uh, and planted, uh, I forget the number of trees that were planted that day, but uh, anyway, there was enough to keep the students and all the volunteers busy uh, all afternoon planting trees around the school. Uh, one other thing we've done is, uh, worked with George Plaster. He's a, a sports talk radio icon in the Nashville area and uh, he's on 102.5 the game and uh, he's he's been doing this on his show for us. Now let me talk to you about the folks at the uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Willie you were gone but Mike Oregon did a story painting me as the big outdoorsman and some of you who know me say he doesn't know the first thing about the outdoors other than he's got a crappy golf game and that's outdoors well you're probably right but the fact of the matter is all of us 
sort of feel like we're in an area that's really special. And a lot of it is based on the outdoors. And a lot of it wouldn't be around right now without the TWRA. In fact, none of this would have been possible without the support of hunters and anglers who have purchased licenses over the years. And these license dollars go directly to TWRA's efforts to continue its legacy of wildlife management. The best way to support wildlife, purchase a license. It's a great investment in Tennessee's wildlife future. And uh, this is the, the article he was referring to. Uh, Mike Organ called me on the phone and said, hey, I was listening to George Plaster and I heard you guys are advertising on there. Tell me about that. So anyway, there's a little article that he, uh, he did as a follow-up to that. And I explained to him that we were looking to uh, reach, a, uh, reach out to a slightly different audience than we might normally reach out to. And uh, I know a lot of our, our customers are, are listening to that show. But there are a lot that are on the fringes, too, that have young families that uh, might be looking for things to do on the weekend. And uh, so we thought we'd give that a try. Uh, along with that radio package, we also got involved with the uh, sports festival that George puts on. Uh, this is the second year for it. He was the very first event, if you ever hear him talking about it, he was the very first event in the new Music City Center last year. And uh, anyway, here's his coverage map on the right. Uh, some logos of uh, folks that are involved with uh, the Music City Sports Festival. Uh, this year they had Tim Tebow, uh, uh, gosh, uh, very high profile coaches, players that, that came to be a part of the program. Uh, the Predators there on the right. Uh, they have uh, uh, stages where they have uh, presentations from the, the, the sports personalities. And as you can see right square in the middle, we, uh, we had our archery range. We also had fish casting for the uh, young people. We had our 65th trailer there. Uh, a couple of the Predators girls had stopped by to take a look. And uh, Smokey Bear even made a visit to our trailer. This was the floor as it appeared there uh, this past year. And of course at the Music City Center. Um, speaking of the trailer, we've had that thing out and about all summer long. Uh, various fairs and events. Uh, this happened to be at the uh, Wildlife Refuge over uh, the Visitor Center Grand Opening near Paris uh, this summer. And we had uh, really good crowds out there. Uh, there's, there's just a partial list of some of the places it's appeared. The Wounded Soldiers Bass event, Sports Festival that I just told you about, uh, over to Crossville for the BOW and Free Fishing Day the Toys event, Tennessee Outdoor Youth Summit, uh, all week at the SCTP, National Wildlife Refuge in Paris, and uh, on and on. Putnam County Fair did the whole week there, Dixon County Fair, the, the run of the fair, and a couple of Jake's days, and, and as you can see, it's got more places to go this fall. Um, and many other events, you know, that our, our regional personnel have done uh, beyond what I'm talking about, just the normal stuff that they're out doing all the time, uh, fairs especially during the summer, and uh, other events that uh, make sense for us to be at. Um, one last thing, Tennessee Uncharted, the name of our new television program. Um, just a real quick update on that is that uh, we have a premiere date set for November 1, and it'll air statewide on public TV. We'll get you more details uh, as we get closer, but mark November 1 on your calendar anyway. It's, uh, it's solid that, that we will begin airing uh, uh, the first episode that, that, that weekend. It'll, it'll air on Saturday at uh, 6 p.m. and Sunday mornings at, uh, I believe it's 9 a.m., and those are central times, I'm quoting you. Um, and one of the great things about it is the theme song. 
and I had nothing to do with writing it. Um, uh, the, the host, uh, Eric Baker, who will be hosting all the shows, uh, wrote it, uh, co-wrote it and, and sang it and uh, had the privilege of recording it at uh, Commissioner Stroud's studio. One evening I, I had the pleasure of being there and uh, the musicians did a wonderful job and I got to see Commissioner Stroud in his element producing this record and it, it really sounds great. I can't wait for you to hear it. If I may add about the show, um, and I'll be really quick, Don, uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised as to what this show is going to look like and sound like. I mean, it is, it's truly a, a, a difference in what we've been doing compared to what we're getting ready to do and the way we're going to not only make the show work, but to brand <clears throat> our agency. So there is a plan there. Of course, you have to start out with with the show getting shot and the music and so forth, but there's a plan not only for the show, but what is inside the show, how you build the brand. And so as we go and, and as you look at this, not only is the look different, but we're sort of uh, applying a process that we bring in people that are not normally going to watch it or be aware of it. One of the things we really were uh, wanting to look at and, and promote and, and uh, get a, a real feel for as far as bringing people in is the female, uh, the women that, that are outdoors people and the kids. And uh, our new host and the way this is shot, the way it's written, plus I think, you know, like I said, the, the music is sort of cool and, and I think it's, it's going to be a bright, nice bright show for us and we'll be very proud of it. He did a great job. Uh, and our new uh, production team is really, really good at the way they shoot. So it'll be, it'll be, uh, I, th I think, a really happy time for us and something we'd be proud of. And that's all I have. Any questions for Don? Mr. Bill? You always do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to question you. My feelings are hurt, though. I thought you were going to ask me to. That was the next, that was actually the next thing I've done. Help. Yes. Uh, that was the next thing I was going to do. We really want you to, we want to have the sun coming up, you know, a shot of the sun coming up. So we want your head. <laughs> you already tried it. Didn't you? Yes, I have. <laughs> any other any questions? For We're good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Chairman Stroud. At this time, we'll take about a 10-minute break.